Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a celebration video, a 9,000 subscriber celebration video. And I'll tell you what, I'm honored to kind of be in the situation that I'm in. Never thought I'd have this many subscribers off of just what I do, which is basically talk, hit play, talk, hit stop, and upload the damn video. Zero editing. Um, and I've grown kind of a community of followers that I've come to really respect. And I've said it before on many videos, I'll say it again, I learned just as much from you guys as you do from me. It's an honor and a pleasure to get to do these videos for you guys. So today, I'm going to call this video format a reference video. And the reason I'm calling it a reference video is because my idea is that I'm going through some of the different notes, which if you really want to go deep into the weeds, I've got entire videos on each one of these notes, okay, called This Is Not A Top 10. If you're new to my channel, there's an entire This Is Not A Top 10 playlist, okay, where you can go and watch everything in my collection that has that note. I just did a two hour video on cardamom just a couple days ago, um, which I thought I had done before, but happened to get left out. So now that my collection has swelled, these videos are getting harder to har and harder to do. But someone had the great idea where they should say, pick out a couple of fragrances from each type. So let's say you pick castorium, pick out two or three fragrances that you consider to be reference castorium fragrances in your collection, and then compile a, a list together. So I've broken this up in half. There'll definitely be a part two, maybe even a part three. Um, but we're doing part one today. So this is, uh, I think there's 18 notes that I ended up choosing to begin with. So probably a third of all of the, this is not a top 10 videos that I've done. That's why I say there's probably at least two or three more videos in this format, if this is a popular format. So reference uh, fragrances in my collection from, from each type, okay, is kind of how we're gonna do it. Um, and, and one thing I have to say before we get started is that keep in mind a couple things. Um, number one, somebody the other day was like, you talk about a bunch of very hard to find stuff. I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, that, I talk about what I love and that's that. Um, so sometimes there is a little bit of a collector side of this hobby as well. Finding a specific version of a fragrance, which I'm really into finding, a, 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 I won't say the correct, but let's say the correct version for me and my collection that I want. And I like talking about that with you guys. Um, that's one piece of the puzzle here. So sometimes there is, you're gonna have to hunt for some of this. Some of these are not easy. Some of these, you, it may take you years to find, okay? I didn't build this collection overnight, I'll tell you that. That's the first thing. Second thing is that there are some fragrances in this list that can fit into multiple slots, you know? So, so for example, Antaeus is in the Castorium list, but it easily could also be in the leather list that I did. Um, there is Desandra that's in the uh, or, or Devin that's in the um, aldehydes part we're going to get to, but it easily could be in the galvanum part as well, okay? So keep that in mind. There isn't like a perfect fit for many of these, but enough where we can have a, a good discussion. I think this will be a very appreciated and liked video, okay? So my scent of the day is actually in this breakdown, so I'm just going to let it come to us organically. So we're not going to do an original scent of the day. So let's get started. I just alphabetized um, so we're going to start with aldehydes and just kind of work our way down. Okay, so aldehydes are at the top and aldehydes, it's interesting because many people think of aldehydes as giving this airy, you know, um, almost like adding space to a fragrance. And, and there is some truth to that, but many people also think of aldehydes being in the top and they usually are in the top of a fragrance in the note construction, but there are some aldehydes that last throughout the entire length of the life of the fragrance. Many people don't realize that, but um, probably the most popular fragrance we'll begin with, and, and I want a new bottle of this. I want a bottle very similar to my unboxing of the vintage, uh, a gentleman's cologne from Chanel that I did, like a brand new one. I want a brand new one of this. This is That's on the list. Um, once everything is sorted out with my life, which is crazy right now, I will, I'll, I'll hunt that down. But um, this is Chanel number five, and this is my favorite version. You can see I don't have very much left. Um, I only have 10, 15 mils left, I would say. And, and this is um, the Eau de Cologne. And the reason the Eau de Cologne is my favorite version of Chanel Number no. 5 is it still gives you that aldehydic classical French bouquet opening that you get. Neroli, Ylang with the aldehydes, Jasmine, Iris, Lily of the Valley, and Rose. That classic French bouquet that you've come to expect from Chanel Number no. 5. It's slightly floral, slightly powdery. Um, it's got brilliant bergamot lemon in the top, but it, it is more animalic in the base so it has civet and and the civet is much more amped up so many of the men in the past when when um uh, these women targeted fragrances were sometimes worn by men for example jiki is a great example of that 
Um, this is one such example where men very regularly gravitated towards wearing the eau de cologne version of Chanel number no. five. So I, I need to find a, a refill, a backup of this, let's say. So Chanel number no. five is the first example of a reference aldehyde fragrance. The next one is an, is an Aramis, and honestly, I picked two from this perfumer because I think he is the master of two things. One is Chypres. Uh, he's kind of what Roja Dove wishes he was, and that, that perfumer is Bernard Shaw. And the second is aldehydes. The way he played with aldehydes in the top is mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. And his he, he actually shows up all over this list. It's interesting. But um, Aramis Aramis is my selection for an amazing alde aldehydic opening. Now, this is also an amazing leather sheepra. This could also be in the leather category. It's also green. It has this amazing sort of um, dense, bitter, kind of earthy, um, soily Artemisia in the top with this, um, you know, very masculine spice combination of cumin and thyme um, with that green Artemisia. There's some sage in here, clary sage, um, which um, adds to the leathery bit. There's myrtle, which I love myrtle. Um, there's cardamom, clove, and then leather and a bunch of oak moss in the base, especially in these older versions that say cologne. If you can find the older ones before they went to the modern eau de toilette when they used to just call it a cologne because everything men wore back in the day was a cologne. Men didn't wear eau de parfum back in the day. Men wouldn't buy a parfum or anything like that. They they considered that for women. Men wore cologne and so that's how brands targeted it to them. Some of these older bottles people don't know kind of what they have. If you can find some of these older cologne bottles go for it. They're they're amazing. Bernard Chant is I mean he is on the Mount Rushmore I think of greatest perfumers in my opinion. So um that is the original Aramis from 1964. And the final um, aldehydic fragrance I chose, I mentioned it in the opening of this video, that is Devon. Um, Devon is one of the greatest green, masculine, targeted sheepers I've ever smelled. Uh, it's spicy, it's woody, it's um, it's got mugwort, galvanum with that aldehydic opening in the beginning. It is a response, I would say, to the green, quote-unquote green 1970s. So you think of things like... Um, um, you think of things like Chanel number no. 19, which are coming up here a little bit later in the list when we talk about Galvanum, but that green 1970s um, touch, which was capped off by things like uh, Private Collection by Estee Lauder, for example, that easily could have been on, 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 a, on a Galvanum list, let's say. But Devon, I chose for the aldehyde just so I could feature another perfume from the great Bernard Shaw, master of aldehydes. And if you've never smelled Devon, and you're a lover of vintage perfumery, I would urge you, heavily urge you to check this out. So, um, so yes, Devon by Aramis from 1977. Um, and if you take a look, by the way, it's not just a cologne, it's a country eau de cologne. Ah, the good old days. Um, but yes, it is, um, this is really something special. I'll tell you that. And, and for the warmer weather, I love wearing this in the warm because even though it's heavy in, in the base, in the dry down, um, it's got this piney, stone pine needle thing going on with um, leather and labdanum and oak moss. It is a little heavy in the base, but I feel like that greenness makes allows you to wear it in the heat pretty easily for a guy. Okay, now we're going to go on to ambergris. And ambergris is a notoriously expensive ingredient, so much so that many of the modern ambergrises that you smell are synthetic alternatives, okay? Um, so ambroxin is like a straight... Um, you know, response to what how expensive real ambergris has become. Back in the day, all high-end perfumes used real ambergris. You know, you go buy a Yves Saint Laurent or a Dior or something, it was expected you were getting real ambergris in the old days. Not anymore. Now it's expected you're getting something cheap and fake almost. Um, and it's and when you get the real thing, it's almost like a um, you know, you're you're paying a premium for that type of perfumery, or you're going to one of these kind of shadowy um, you know, uh brands that are artisanal or off off the beaten path kind of thing, right? Not the brands you're going to find at Macy's. And we're going to talk about three such brands today when it comes to ambergris. So this is one that gets almost no talk. In fact, I think my review of this is the only one on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. So it's almost like a exclusive review, but um, this is called Pheromone Por Homme, and the house is called La Via del Profumo. And La Via del Profumo is run by a guy named Dominique Dubrano, and he calls himself Abdez Salam Attar. Very interesting. I had a conversation with my father yesterday, who is Jordanian, 
Um, and, and, and I brought a Sultan Pasha Atar with me to his house and I swiped his hand. I like swiping stuff on him just to get his reaction because he's kind of, you know, well outside of the world that of hardcore fragrance fanatics we live in. Um, and he said, it's interesting you're calling it an Atar because in Arabic culture, when, when you refer to someone as Atar, that's basically the person who makes the perfume. And I said, okay. And the first thing I thought about was this guy's name. And he goes by Abdez Salam Atar. And before it made no sense. But I guess now if you think of it in that light, it makes perfect sense why he would call himself Abdez Salam Atar. Basically, he's saying, I am the perfume maker. My name is Abdez Salam. That's kind of the name he took. Um, so it makes more sense to me now. But uh, this guy works with 100% natural ingredients. And he was very famous for saying that um, I failed over and over trying to make perfumes using the synthetics. But once I really went into the naturals, I realized that there's no super secret to it. It's about using good materials and properly blending them and stuff like that. Um, and so this is a fragrance that has castoreum, sandalwood, real ambergris, bergamot, iris, lavender, oak moss, patchouli, and pipe tobacco. And somehow he created this accord that it feels brimy, like the ocean has come up on your skin pulled back and left its brimy saltiness behind. That real ambergris in here is amazing. It's animalic. Um, it is exactly what you think of ambergris. It's got that sparkly texture, like you shine a spotlight on your on the place that you sprayed, and, and you can see the sparkle from the ambergris, almost like a jewel or a diamond. Go watch my full review on pheromone pour on, but this stuff is pretty impressive stuff. Now, I will say there is a new packaging or a new version of this. Um, he says the scent itself is intact, but he had to change a couple things here and there. But one of the best out and out real ambergris fragrances I've ever smelled. And, and it, of course, it's supposed to be a pheromone. It's the, it's the, obviously humans don't have pheromones. That's the, um, that's the myth that some brands will sell. Wear this and women will have to be attracted to you. Well, it doesn't work that way. We don't have, um, a, a musk pod, like a musk deer or something like that, right? So um, this is kind of an imaginary creation of what a human pheromone would smell like if we had them. And he hit it out of the park with this. This is special spot, special stuff for, for an ambergris lover. Um, pheromone pour homme is, is very under the radar, but worth hunting down and not outrageous either. His um, website is... Um, Profumo.it because he's based in Italy. So so yeah, so that's the one that's one. The other one is called Ombre Supreme from Lesson Demo Dablas. This is an Ant Antoine Lee creation, which again I have a full review on the channel if you want to check this out. Um, this house is very open about the percentage of ambergris that they use, and it's pretty high when when you can all things considered. But Antoine Lee basically used aldehydes, clary sage, Indian cardamom, Madagascan pink pepper. Moroccan Jasmine Absolute, Neroli Patchouli, Ambergris, and Immortel to really give this sun sparkling off the ocean feel. I mean, just imagine the ocean. Imagine being on a boat, see the ocean go all the way to the horizon, and from every kind of twist of the waves, up and down, the sun hits it. It's like a chink in, in armor, right? And it just reflects into your eye on every little piece of the ocean. That's how Ombre Supreme feels. But go watch my review if you want to learn a little bit more about it. Came out in 2021, but easily one of the best ambergris scents that you can just click buy on. Go to go to their website, click buy on. They're not super expensive. I think 50 mils will set you back 250 bucks or something. But for this type of perfumery, it's not bad considering what some niche houses are are paying are charging nowadays. And finally. The first of many Russian Adam, Maurice Ladore creations, and he has a new scent coming out soon, by the way, which I cannot wait for. I can't wait to get my nose on it. I hope he sends me a sample. It's um, called uh, Vietnamese Oud, I think, or Oud Vietnam or something like that. But um, it's a it's a foresty, leafy green Oud is how he's describing it. Very excited. That's his first kind of leafy green Oud. So I'm excited to, to try that. Um, and, and finally, so we're going to talk about Atlantic Ambergris, which he did the original Atlantic Ambergris, I think in the first collection. Then he did, he went back and did a part two of Atlantic Ambergris. I have videos of both on the channel. I can detect almost no difference in them, even though he talks about how it is exceedingly hard to work with these natural ingredients, because even if you use the exact same chunk of Ambergris and let it, let's say, macerate in perfumer's alcohol, 
and you you make a fragrance and then you come back a year or two later and make another fragrance from the exact same piece of ambergris it'll be different because it sat for a year or two longer um so he's like it's almost impossible to get it exactly the same that's that's the problem with natural ingredients that's why so many of these houses love things like ambroxan uh and something where they know it's going to smell exactly like this Every single time, a thousand times out of a thousand, whether we do it today, tomorrow, or 10 years from now, right? Um, that's why some of these big houses have gone away from using real ambergris. But um, this is, you know, mysterious. It's, um, they, he describes it as having bottomless depth, and it's true, you know? It has this fluffy, silky, slightly powdery, sweet, earthy um, nature to it, and extremely high high grade real white ambergris was used in atlantic ambergris um and it adds this 3d effect to a composition right it it's it's um it it really makes the fragrance pop off of your skin and you can see this is all i have left um i've worn the piss out of this i've, I've actually enjoyed wearing this much more than i thought i would um and i mean i would like a bottle one day but i won't i won't pay the prices in the secondary market that are being asked for this but um, this fragrance, Atlantic Ambergris, is exceedingly, I would say, spicy, and in, in more, it's a little bit more spicy than you would expect, so especially when it comes to things like the clove and the nutmeg, they're, they're much more turned up, and you can almost tell by the color of the juice, it's darker than you would expect an Ambergris fragrance to be, there's also things like sweet myrrh, um, which is a Papanax, and, um, Nagamatha, which is cypriol and labdanum and violet leaf and, and pine and there's all these other things going on in here cardamom but um but yes as far as a, a true real ambergris fragrance you're, you're not going to find much better than this so atlantic ambergris one or two whatever you can get your hands on okay next on the list we're going to go to an amber accord and there's three fragrances that i chose although there's obviously more that i've talked about and reviewed on the list um you know, I think of things like Fort and Manly, Amber Absolutely, all that stuff, which are not on the list. But there's many, many, many Ambers and more Ambers, which I'll be, um, I will be discussing pretty soon. I'm thinking of MFK's Absolute Pour Le Soir. That's a, that's a big pissy Amber, which I'll be doing a review on soon for the channel. Unfortunately discontinued, but, um, you know, that's not on the list. But I chose three, three reference Ambers and, um... Two of them you can just go buy, although I'm going to talk about the vintage version of, of one, but um, one of them you can just go buy, the modern stuff most likely, and, and this is um, Serge Luton's Ombre Sultan. Ombre Sultan, and I've got three or four bottles of this stuff, I never want to be without this, one of my favorite ambers, and, and one of the things about it is the um, sort of spicy aspects that Serge Luton put in the top, I love the kind of grandma's spice kitchen thing that hits you in the opening if you will it reminds me of vintage perfumery from the 80s and they put it on this um sort of oriental spicy base that is i don't know if it's like a pre-made base of amber or something but the way it all comes together the resinous aspect the 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 oriental you know chewiness of the amber you know the sticky labdanums all of that stuff the vanillas the patchouli, which very few houses do patchouli, like Serge Luton. In fact, one of Serge's fragrances in my reference patchouli video. So for a reference amber, Ombre Sultan, I mean, you cannot go wrong. This is like classic spicy amber. The other one I left out, which easily could have been on this list, is Lady Desert Moroccan. Easily that could have been on the list, but uh, you can't include everything in these quick list videos. Um, so next on the list we have... Amber Absolute. Now, this is the discontinued one, but this really stole my heart because this is like a big, this is like a big fuck you, Amber. Like, it's just, the, that's the way I would describe it. I mean, it's literally like everything in this is dialed up, which Tom Ford just took that Amber Accord. I'm sure they were thinking of things like Amri Sultan when they, when they created this, but they just turned up the labdanum, the Amber, and they made it a little bit smoky. So, it's a little bit more smoky than Amri Sultan, let's say. It doesn't have the spices though, but I really like the way Tom Ford did this Amber Accord and, and you smell it in a couple of his fragrances. Tobacco Oud, 
I, I would say allegedly takes this amber absolute kind of amber that they created, the, the DNA, if you will, and then added some other things to create tobacco oud. Um, but it's spicy. It's a little bit more woody than, than um, ombre sultan and, and definitely more smoky. And, and more intense is the other thing. This is a very intense, heavy wear. I mean, this is like a 12-hour fragrance when I wear this. Very heavy Tom Ford. Um, amber Absolute. Discontinued, unfortunately. And finally, probably one of my favorite ambers and, and a top 10 fragrance for me of all time. Uh, I grabbed the um, Secret de Parfum because I was tired of show, showing that same opium bottle over and over again. Right, It's peeking out right there. But any of the opiums, even the modern, is good from what I hear because I heard that um, they had to call Jean-Louis Suizag out of retirement to fix the modern one because they effed it up so bad. That's a rumor. I don't know if that's true, but um, this is like a reference amber. This is the Secret de Parfum, one of my favorite versions because the myrrh is amped up in here, but it's got an amber, benzoin, vanilla, patchouli accord in the base to die for with that clove and rose. Oh my God. And that myrrh amped up. Oh... Ah, uh, just beautiful. Myrrh, a poppin' axe, it's resinous, balsamic, just beautiful. I mean, one of the best oriental fragrances of all time, in my opinion, uh, of all time. Um, so this version is discontinued, this secret de parfum, which is basically YSL's fancy way of saying eau de parfum, but from the early 90s. Um, all right, let me pause to hydrate here. This is a Rich Mitch size hydration, by the way. Okay, let us continue. So next we're going to reference boozy fragrances. <clears throat> and um, sorry to do that in your ear, but um, boozy fragrances, I've, um, I have done reviews on the first two. The third one I've got a review coming very soon. So the first one we're going to discuss today is called Creation E, or depending on where you are. If you're in the United States, it's Creation E. If you're in um, Europe, it's Enigma, poor home. Um, something to do with copyrights, but... Oh man, I love this stuff. One of my favorite boozy fragrances because it just goes into this sort of um, cola opening. So you get bergamot, heliotrope, which again, I've said it before, but heliotrope kind of feels like, have you ever been to the dentist and they took like a mold of your tooth? That mold feeling of the putty or Play-Doh going on your tooth is what heliotrope smells like. It smells like it has this depth, you know? Like you're going to fall on it and just sink in and make an indentation. Um, and he's he's used this beautiful cognac. And cognac, actually, you can make an essential oil out of the bottom of the the leaves of the, of the cognac on the bottom of the barrel. Um, make a essential oil out of that. There's a little bit that's kind of left over. And interestingly enough, they call that little bit that's left over angel share. Um, from my understanding, I could be wrong. But I think I heard that somewhere where um, they call that. That's where that's where they got the name Angel Share from for the very popular fragrance, which I hate. Uh, this is way better than Angel Share for me. Uh, it is still a little bit sweet, but it's not. Um, the sweetness doesn't put me off like like it does with Angel Share. So that's one of my favorite boozy fragrances. The other one, which I've reviewed on the channel and unfortunately is discontinued, but I do think it's one of the best things I've smelled from the house of Dies and Durga. Dies and Durga from 2007 to 2000. 15 or whatever it was seemed to make some amazing fragrances and then lately I don't know the newer stuff I, I haven't been as impressed with but they did just sell out to Manzanita Capital so I don't know where the house is going but I'm excited to try more of the early works and this one put me on my ass this is Spirit of the Glen I've got a full review of this on the channel but they basically worked with Glenn uh, Levitt I believe it was not Glenn Fiedek but Glenn Levitt to um, create this scotch whiskey Accord in here. They, 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 I think they literally gave them access to the barrels that Glenn Levitt uses. Um, they've used pineapple weed, pear, grass, limousine oak. It's so smooth. That limousine oak, I don't know, I haven't seen that note anywhere else before, but they used barley malt, bourbon whiskey barrel, sherry cask. There's definitely this barrel, this, this barrel feel to it, but it's so smooth with the limousine oak and this hay like almost tobacco thing. Go watch my full review. I I am in love with Spirit of the Glen. I mean, if, if I needed two boozy fragrances to say, this is what a reference boozy fragrance smells like, these are the two I would show. So, Creation E and um, 
poor old the parfum and uh spirit of the glen which is unfortunately discontinued and one more just for good measure uh this little bad boy right here i'm going to be reviewing this on the channel soon this is called the jus sans fates this is maybe one of the best javoy fragrance that, that no one talks about uh this deserves more love it was created by dorothy po she's a robertette perfumer she's a hell of a perfumer by the way and it's this almost celebratory spicy earthy dried fruits with angelica which adds a touch of green, and there's two boozy notes in Le, Le Jus Sans Fates, uh, gin and Cuban rum, those two. So, um, you know, I think the gin adds a little bit of that freshness to it. The Cuban rum adds a little bit of um, sort of uh, boozy sweetness, if you will. Rum, rum adds a beautiful sweetness to it that doesn't seem to go overly sweet. And, um, but the way she made this fragrance is crazy because it doesn't wear like a heavy boozy fragrance like you would expect. It almost wears, um, like a second skin, you know, it just sits on the top of your skin. Beautiful, beautiful fragrance. Le Jus en Fates. Really enjoy that. Um, it needs to be discussed more in my opinion. Okay. So we've done boozy. We're going to go to Castorium. Now Castorium, I've, I've selected three. Although you know it's my favorite animalic note, if you will. But the first one is a no-brainer. I don't even need to say anything. Um, it is Antaeus. It is, you know, one of my for life fragrances. It's the fragrance that's literally on the banner of my channel when you click on it. Um, it's the Sistine Chapel with uh, man trying to reach Antaeus and barely touching it. Just barely. Um, and, oh, I mean, there, there's an entire vintage... Hall of Fame review that I poured my heart and soul into on Antaeus. So go check that out if you want to learn more about that. And the other one is um, Portos by Balenciaga. And this is also an amazing castorium. Um, speaking of pheromones, I mean, this smells a little bit like what a male pheromone would smell like. Like you put your hands under your arms or in between your crotch, you know, and smell your hands. There's a little bit of that in, in uh, Portos, but I've got an entire review on this as well. Oh my god, Portos is fuck. Um, so good. So, so good. And, and this bottle, luckily, is in perfect condition. So, um, this came from the Duck Den, actually, interestingly enough. Um, he uh, turned on Portos and decided he didn't like it anymore and sold it to me at a very amazing price. So, I'm glad to have that. Very, very glad to have it. Um, okay, now we've got three on... Um, actually, I got one more on uh, Castorium. And I wanted to show you guys a modern one as well. This is from my brother Eugene's house. This is Le Dolaire Exquise. Now, Antoine Lee loves doing kind of, or I would say leaving breadcrumbs for vintage fragrances from the past. So here's the thing. This fragrance could be on my favorite rose list. It could be on my favorite patchouli list. And it could be on a reference castorium list because the castorium in here is probably the best modern castorium I've smelled that smells vintage, if that makes sense. But you have to wait. It doesn't come to you right away. And it's funny because I watched a lot of videos where they'd spray it and they'd go, oh, this is like some Middle Eastern rose patchouli thing with resins. I don't like it. But it's the dry down that's just amazing with this because this castorium comes out that smells like the castorium in the dry down of Antaeus. I swear to God, right hand to God, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not being boorish. I'm not, um, uh, you know, I'm not making, I'm not making uh, extravagant claims or anything like that. This is truly how I feel. I mean, this fragrance, for a modern fragrance, the, the dry down of this, the castorium that comes out, the, the realism for, you know, the, the world we live in with all of the constraints on, on perfumers to create something like this today. Antoine Lee, I mean, to me, he put himself as one of the best, creating some of these the, this trio he's done and some of the things he's done for Eris and some of the things he's done for Lesson de Modavlas, I think he put himself as uh, one of the best living perfumers who is still actively working. Um, but La Dulex Geese, worth a sniff. Um, okay, now let's do three for Civet, my second favorite um, animalic note. And so first we're going to start with the obvious, of course, the greatest, the, the reference of all the reference, um, and that's Koros. Um, we've got the angel... And we've got the devil with Antaeus. But um, Koros is Pierre Bourdon's masterpiece, in my opinion. Um, 
and and just one of the greatest fragrances ever created anyways it came out in 1981 it's got this animalic spicy combination um i think it leans more towards a fougere construction than it does a sheeper construction but um it, it basically is a fragrance of contrast because it feels like there is cleanliness in here there's some clean touches and then there's the dirty touches from the civet the pissy touches this could also be in the honey reference honey video or, 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 um, you know, segment here, if you will. But I mean, so originally this had like an animalis base to recreate that civet like smell and the animalis base was really turned up. And as the years have gone on, they've turned it down and down and down. Apparently rumor is it never had any real civet, even in the original Charles of the Ritz bottle, which is exactly what this is. Um, and if, but if you look around the outside, it almost looks like someone pissed all over the outside of the bottle. That's how dense this juice was back in the day. It is unbelievable though. That pissy civet is out of this world. Very primal. That is a primal fragrance, you know? Like it touches a part of your brain that you can't get to, but your brain, it, it's, it's working, but you can't get to it. The other one that does that for me is uh, Furio. This uses more Ambrette, um, which is like a musk um, substitute, like a, like a plant-based must substitute, but it's very expensive because it has a specific spell now. And this is officially discontinued. For the longest time, people were like, it's not discontinued. I could buy it for $19 at fragrancebuy.ca. Well, you can't do it anymore. Now the only bottles out there are hundreds on eBay. But um, but yes, this is Ambrette, Carnation, Lavender, Coriander, Bergamot, Green Notes, Jasmine, Cinnamon, Geranium, Thyme, Civet, Oak Moss, Moss Patchouli, Amber, Vanilla, and Vetiver. Ron Winograd and Thierry Vasser created this back when Thierry Vasser was allowed to create amazing stuff before Guerlain handcuffed him. Um, but I wish he could make stuff like this again. Um, this is, uh, I mean, this is... The joke is that this is strong enough to power the eastern seaboard for a week on its own from one bottle. Just, you know, pour it in, let it do the work. Um, it's strong enough to fucking rip paint off the walls it is powerful stuff powerful powerful stuff uh but i love it i absolutely love furio one of my favorite civet reference civet fragrance for me the other one i'll show you is the og from gold gold man by amouage i'll review this one of these days this is on my short list to review um it's the original for men very opulent you know it takes bits and pieces from L'Envon's Arpege which was Guy Robert's favorite fragrance he tried to recreate it over and over and over and over again in his career um Lily of the Valley Omani Cistus uh, apparently Cistus Labdanum grows heavily the rock rose grows freely in Oman they also used Omani green frankincense jasmine iris myrrh civet oak moss ambergris cedarwood mysore sandalwood patchouli and white musk um and you know this has this opulent golden like shimmering gold coming down from the ceiling feel um i can't help but think of gold member and when you think about gold man but i mean it really is it's beautiful um and and if you're a guy and you can pull this off you're gonna smell like no one else i mean no no other guy is wearing stuff like this nowadays it it, it would definitely set you apart um there are some people that say it smells like a dirty diaper. I don't get any of that personally, but there is some civet in there that can come across as slightly pissy from time to time. Now, honorable mention reference civet fragrance uh, real quick is from the House of Arise La Dore, and it is a fragrance called Civet de Nuit. And I actually reviewed this. This is my little sample that I have of Civet de Nuit still. I had a second sample that I pretty much all used up. But uh, this was created by Sultan Pasha with Russian Adam working as the creative director. And the idea is it's an animalic floral that um, is supposed to use this vintage civet. So the vintage civet to me, and I put some here before I started the video, but the vintage civet almost smells a little bit like Kopi Luwak. Like it's gone through the intestines, like the coffee has gone through the intestine of the civet and, and you, get, um, you get this sort of like um, the civet that's been neutralized a little bit like the the years have put age on it you know you can still smell it's dirty you can still smell like you're almost smelling like it almost smells like you're smelling the animal or where the animal lives you know like um like you're smelling the civet cage or something instead of the actual civet note so it's a little bit more furry 
um, a little bit more musky, but it, it does have a little bit of that dirtiness, but this is a beautiful kind of old school creation. Like if you like things like Le Bleu by Guerlain, that, that kind of thing, if you like my Grossmith uh, reviews, uh, if you like something like Shemel Nessim, I would urge you to check out Sivet Danawi. It is really impressive work by um, Sultan Pasha. Really, really good stuff. Um, and it's got aldehydes in the top and, and uh, heliotrope and real white ambergris and apparently real Mysore sandalwood as well. So um, very special creation. Good stuff. Very, very, I think, underappreciated because I think a lot of people expected it to be like Koros. But it's a vintage civet. It's totally different. Okay, let's move on to um, galbanum. Now, galbanum is a resin, and it, of course, is a green resin, uh, and it can smell very dense and and thick. Um, and there's a couple of reference galbanums that I have decided to highlight here, um, and most of these are going to be pretty. Most people who know galbanum are going to pick these out pretty easily. Um, some people say galvanum can smell like um, this kind of bitter paint, this green smelling paint, or, or like mashed peas. I've heard people say mashed peas as well. Um, you know, some people say it can add this um, herbal mintiness to it as well. But basically, it's a very aromatic like gum resin. So think of like a resin, okay? Um, and and, and um, galvanum used to come from Iran. Some of the best galbanum back in the day came from Iran. Iranian galbanum was very sought after, and the very early bottles of um, some of the fragrances we're going to discuss today used Iranian galbanum. But um, this one is called, the first one we're going to start out is from 1933, the X-Ray, specifically the X-Ray, because the Eau de Toilette smells totally different to me. The X-Ray, this is one of the greatest fragrances I've ever smelled ever in my life. Um, the extra of Valdinawi has been like a revelation to me. One of my brothers brought this back from Japan for me and sold it to me at a very, very, very reasonable price. Otherwise, there's no way I'd be able to afford the prices these are going for nowadays, especially a vintage like this. Oh, and the fact it didn't have the propeller on the front, it came off. I got it for an even better deal because all I wanted was the juice. But this is, I mean, reference galbanum for me. And it's from 1933 is the thing. And, um... I mean, I don't even know if I have the words to describe this. I mean, Valdinawi was supposed to be uh, based off of a book, Night Flight, I believe it was called. Um, but the, the the words on the front, Valdinawi, were written almost like a propeller would be written. And remember, um, flight was in its infancy at that time. It was kind of a newer thing still. So the propeller on the plane was... a. Uh, um, it was like an image of innovation, almost like we would think of a Tesla now or something like that, right? Um, and, and so it's green, it's spicy, it's, uh, but the galbanum in here is, especially in the x-ray, it's so rich and deep and it just goes into this mossy, orisey, garlinade thing. I don't even know how to describe it, honestly. All I know is it's one of the greatest green fragrances I've ever smelled, ever, and that galbanum in the top is the star. Uh, it's one of the stars. I, I am in love with the X-Ray of Alden Um The other one which I really, really love is the Eau de Toilette, specifically the Eau de Toilette, although I would love to, to have a bottle of the X-Ray as well, of Chanel number 19. The reason I like the Eau de Toilette, I've got, I've got a couple bottles of, of this if it looks like this has never been used, that's why. Um, but the Eau de Toilette is um, more my personal style because it's not as floral. The Eau de Parfum I've smelled was much more floral smelling than the eau de, eau de toilette. The eau de toilette focuses a little bit more on the galbanum and a little more on some of the other notes in there, like the oak moss and the leather and the cedarwood and sandalwood combination and musk. Speaking of uh, Ro the Robert family, this is Henri Robert who created this from 1971. Um, and and so yes, this was this was kind of right at the beginning of the green decade, the green 70s. And finally, speaking of amazing galbanum, I'll give you guys a modern one as well. And I'm going to stay with um, the house that I used previously for Castorium. This is Les Abstraits again. This is DeSandra's. So DeSandra's came out last year in 2023. Again, it was created by Antoine Lee. The galbanum in this mixed with there's a birch tar and Swiss pine tar note. Oh my God, this stuff is fucking phenomenal. It's smoky, it's green, it's like a niche version of Devon, okay? So if you like Devon, that's the first thing that popped in my mind whenever I thought about DeSandra's. 
but the way that the leather, and there's an Indian tuberose note in here, but no one uses tuberose like Antoine Lee. I mean, Antoine Lee uses tuberose in, in ways unimaginable. Actually, all of my favorite uh, tuberose fragrances are Antoine Lee creations. I love the way he uses that note. Um, there is an animalic note in here, African Hyrax, and it dries down to this leathery, vetiver, patchouli, oak moss thing. Um, very foresty, outdoorsy. <sighs> This is, this is, this is what perfumery is all about for me. Um, and the fact that it's a modern brand, and what's crazy is hearing some of these just, I, I would say uninformed folks talk shit because they're like, oh, it's a YouTuber brand. They don't know what they're talking about. I don't think they, I don't think they um, realize the, um, I don't think they realize that he probably could have charged double what he's charging for that. Um, so, so yes, Desandra's and, um, La Duleric Skis both deserve to be on this list. Okay, next on the list, we've got Honey, one of my favorite notes of all time. And, um, again, some of these are going to be pretty, if you know me, you know what's coming, but boss number one has to be the reference of the reference Honey fragrances for me. I've got an entire Vintage Hall of Fame review on this, but as far as pissy Honey goes, oh man, this is so good. And it's so, I've often described this fragrance as a man who knows that he has responsibilities and fulfills those responsibilities like a man should, a head of the household should, right? And boss number one just just encapsulates that somehow for me. It is um, it is a special fragrance. Go watch my uh, full review on that if you're interested. One that I plan on reviewing very soon is Lapidus Porom. This came out in 1987, I believe. Um, 1987. Yeah, so Boss was 85. This was 87. Now, this uses a pineapple note in the top, but it's not Aventus, so this goes to show how far back the pineapple note came. Aventus did not create the pineapple accord in the top, but they've mixed it with, and this has everything, honey, tobacco, woods, florals, rose, pine, it's green, it's woody, it's, uh, it's got lavender, um, and it's got that pissy animalic honey. There's probably some civet in here as well, you know, some people compare this with Koros and some other things, but um, that's one. And the final honey fragrance I'll highlight is one I just reviewed within the last month or so. It's called Success by the House of MCM. Unfortunately, this is discontinued. But go watch my full review. This is spicy, resinous, thick tobacco honey. Oh, my God. Uh, um, orange, rose, bergamot, lemon, carnation, jasmine, patchouli, cedar, vetiver, iris, more honey. So honey in the top, honey in the base, oak moss, leather, and it definitely dries down leathery. Ugh, so good. Ambery, too. Um, sad that type of perfumery is dead. Okay, next on the list, we've got um, Iris. I only grabbed a couple. Iris is one of those fragrances that I, I probably could have grabbed 10. I mean, it's one of my favorite notes of all time, but here's two, I would say, reference Iris fragrances for me. One is Hedis by Hermes, Hermes, um, this is, um, this is like an iris solar floor. Actually, I've, I've smelled iris with 80% irons, thanks to my brother, Russian Adam. I've smelled some of the best iris you could imagine. I mean, Francesca Bianchi, uh, boasts on her website about her iris, uh, oris butter being 15% iron. She's like 15% irons, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Well, I've smelled 80% irons, which is almost unheard of. And the closest fragrance I've ever smelled from the designer realm to smell like that is Hadis. Hadis is like a beautiful iris solar floor. Um, and Hermes takes amazing care of their fragrance. There's iris, amber, carnation, honey, almond notes in here. Olivia Jacobetti created this, but it basically comes together to give it that floral, earthy, papery feel of iris and, and hedis. It's beautiful. And then we've got Dior Om, the original silver stem from 2005, not the Francois de Machy reformulation. Um, this is powdery, sweet iris with lavender, a little bit of cacao, like chocolate powder, um, dust sprinkled on top of the iris. Um, Oh, for, for a designer, this is so detailed. You know, Rich Mitch describes this as Olivier Poles, which, by the way, in-house perfumer for Chanel made one of my favorite Dior's, go figure. But um, it, uh, it, it feels like 
you know, everything in here is so legible. It's um, like it's written with a like it's colored in. All of the details are kind of seen, whereas the newer ones are just painted with a thick brush. You know, it's a great comparison by by Rich Mitch. Um, love this stuff though. The silver stem, if you can still find a bottle, one of my favorite designers of all time. Okay, next on the list, we're going with leather. I had to do four here. I, I mean, I probably could have done 10 or 20, but um, some reference leather fragrances for me. First, one I just got in the collection, and I'm almost sad. Well, not sad, but I'm almost like kicking myself that I didn't have this sooner. Um, and I have to give a shout out to my brother Anuj at Enchante for supplying me with this as a very generous gift. This is um, Queermoresque by the great Serge Luton. I believe this is a 2012 bottle, if I remember correctly. Um, and I smelled this on a blind sniff, thanks to Armando, and look at that. I mean, is that not just, it's almost angelic. It almost looks like an angel, right? This bottle almost looks like an angel when it's full to me. Uh, but this stuff is, oh my God. I mean, Oh, fuck. This is just so good. I mean, it is... Go watch... I was going to say, go watch my Blind Sniff episode. My last Blind Sniff live stream where I talk about this. But I, after that episode, I wore this for like four days straight, by the way. Which I almost never do. But that's how just blown away I was by, by this. Um, and just the fact that I didn't know it, you know, really... Uh, just goes to show how much is out there. How, how you think you know something... You don't know shit. There is, you know, there's always something else to, 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 to learn. Once you think you know everything, that's when you've lost. Um, so it, this, this game is always about learning. Okay, so the other reference um, leather for me is Coy de Russi by Chanel. Um, this is the vintage Eau de Cologne. I think this is a 70s bottle. I'm not really 100% sure. You can kind of see the proof right there through. It says 75 proof. Um... And, but this stuff is, I mean, this is masterful. I got it from a guy who used to sell fragrances in, from Italy, but apparently shipping became a big issue from Italy back in, back. So I, I got lucky when I got mine is basically what I'm saying. He ended up going out of business or selling off all his stuff and doing something else. Um, but this came sealed with like a gold coating over it. Um, and he, like, you know, when you get, like, a yogurt and it's, like, got that foil over it, but this was, like, a piece of, like, gold-looking foil. And I, and I think I even kept it. I think I still have it. Um, but, but it, so this is about as fresh as fresh can be. It was, it was literally no air had gotten in there until I opened it. And it is everything you would expect from a Chanel Coeur de Russi. Um, and then, of course, a, a leather that's going to be discussed heavily will get a vintage Hall of Fame review on my channel and easily could have also been in the galbanum section of um, this video is Bandit by Robert Piguet. Um, Germaine Cellier is the perfumer here from 1940 something. I can't remember when, but aldehydes, tarragon, galbanum, um, civet, leather, castorium, patchouli, myrrh, vetiver. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you think about like when women were beginning to kind of, um, in, in the 1940s, of course, many of the men were at war, basically, in World War II. So they had to they, think of Rosie the Riveter and stuff like that. And then going out afterwards and smoking cigarettes, women were never allowed to smoke back. Or it wasn't proper, not that they weren't allowed, but it wasn't proper for a woman to smoke, right? Uh, that's where that saying about Shalimar comes in. The proper woman didn't smoke, didn't curse didn't wear Shalimar or something. It was something like that. Um, and, and so this fragrance was all about kind of women smoking and going out and being free kind of thing. But God bless the women who used to wear this because this is one of the most masculine leathers I've ever smelled ever in my life. Um, you know, I, I think it's got, I think Roja's Diaghilev borrows a little bit from something like Bandi. Um, I think Aramis Aramis borrows a little bit from something like Bandy. So it's just amazing seeing the connections. But yeah, Bandy is one of the all-time great leathers. And finally, how could I do a leather reference video without my all-time favorite, Bellamy? I pulled out the big boy bottle for you guys too. The fat, look at that. Just fits perfectly in the hand. Uh, and I've got pr pretty big hands. Um, but Bellamy is, um, I'm going to review it 
one of these days I'm going to come around to reviewing this, but it is, I mean, if you've ever had a fragrance in your journey, okay, where you've just smelled it and instantly you're like, that is for me. That is, that is a lifetime fragrance for me. And this is a reference leather for me. Um, Jean-Louis Suizac, who is one of, I think for, for me personally, you know, he did, op I talked about opium. I talked about Bellamy. The stuff he's done is the best of the best of the best in, in my eyes. And there's also this very slightly smoky, woody aspect to Bellamy that I really, really enjoy. But that leathery dry down with the castorium is to die for, you know, it's for me, it's a, it's a reference leather. Okay. So next on the list after leather, we've got oak moss. Now, oak moss, um, I'm going to highlight two vintages and a modern. Um, actually, I lied. We're going to do oak moss next, after this next one, which was going to be musk. So let's keep it in alphabetical order. So let's do musk next. So musk, um, I'm going to show you one that you can just go buy right now. Okay, you can just go buy it right now, the modern, and still be happy. This is musk Kublai Khan. And you can see I have just enough to do a review left of it um, for you guys. But musk Kublai Khan is this dirty animalic musk um, by Serge Luton that has notes of castorium, ambret, beeswax, civet, labdanum, ambergris, costus root, basically almost all the animalics except for hyrax. I wouldn't be surprised if there was hyrax in here. Caraway, patchouli, rose, and vanilla, and it just has this, you know, you know how I described ambergris as like the wave coming in, leaving the remnants on your hand and washing away? Well, imagine like musk kublai Khan is like the wave comes in and what's left behind is musk. Like it just puts a musk pot on your hand. Um, and, and, but it feels like the remnants of a musk pot, you know, like, um, like musk kublai Khan wears like the, the remnants of ambergris wears, but smells like musk, if that makes sense. It's a very strange fragrance to describe. I'll, I'm going to try to review it one of these days. And again, the angelic look of the bottle, but inside it's not an angel. Uh, this is actually a really tough wear for me personally. I'll, um, I had an ex that wore that surprisingly enough. It came out in 1998. So when I was, let's just say in the early 2000s, when I, when I was in, when I was in the dating game, uh, I had an ex who wore musk Kublai Khan and the image of her wearing it it's like seared into my brain. Um, but yes, I, I'll try to review that one a day, one of these days. But that's one of the reasons why it's so hard for me to discuss Musk Kublai Khan. Okay, next on the list, we have two from my one of my favorite houses, Aris Ladore. First, we're going to talk about Siberian Musk, which, um, you know, speaking of hard to find fragrances, I mean, I have to talk about these because, oh my God. I mean, when you talk about real musk, smelling real musk, is a heavenly experience. I mean, it's um, the, one of the purest forms of exploration in the perfume game I've ever known. And um, in Siberia, it's still legal to basically uh, hunt the musk deer. Um, there are tags that are given because the people live off of the deer, so they don't just kill them for the musk pod, they use the entire deer. Um, and this is basically a a musk fragrance that you smell everything the musk deer has to offer. Yes, you get kind of the furry elements. Um, you get some of the some of the animalic elements as well. Some of the smoky elements. Russian Adam described it as like smoke without a fire. Okay, and um, some of the cooling greener elements in here. There's some cooling galbanum, some Siberian smoky pine, some exotic fruits that are mixed in here. Um, and a little bit of oud. So you get some papau oud from New Guinea, some blue cypress absolute, but this is really a recreation of the smell of natural must to me. It's, um, oh my God. I mean, um, he says that it's a, uh, uniquely fresh, spicy, slightly animalic scent conjuring up images of the wild forested lands of Siberia. Um, and I agree 100%. I mean, it it feels like you're smelling um, 
the whole land around the deer. You know, yes, you're smelling the deer. You're also smelling the grass that the deer eats. You're smelling the tree the deer rubbed on. You're smelling the air it's breathing. You're smelling everything around the deer. Uh, and, and this uh, just encapsulates that. It is, for a musk lover, you have to smell. It's hard to say you have to smell something that there was like 50 bottles for the whole world or 100 bottles or whatever this was. But there was a Siberian musk two and three now. So there's more bottles floating around. But I know it's hard to come by, but my God, man, that is that is really something special. The other one that's really special that's even harder to come by because, again, there was only... How many bottles did I say? 100 for the whole world? Yeah, it was 100 bottles, I think, for the whole world. And there was no part two or three of this because this had these little micro distillations that Russian Adam did, these co-distillations that he did and then built the fragrance around that that he did over a long period of time. And he said it would be impossible to recreate those co-distillations. But this is Inverno Russo. And Inverno Russo is... Um, oh, my God. It is uh, Rose Alba Otto, White Pepper Absolute, extracted by Russian Atom. Peach Blossom and Osmanthus Co-Absolutes, extracted by Russian Atom. White Frankincense, distilled by Russian Atom. White Gardenia, White Champaka, Clove, Cardamom, Indian Sandalwood, Tonka Bean, Absolute. Tincture of Legally Obtained Wild Siberian Musk Pod and Synthetic Civet. Rare Wild Hainan Agarwood Oil, aged over five years. Indian Oud Oil, White Indonesian Garu Boya, Betel Leaf which is another very rare material, Virginian cedarwood and benzoin. And um, he describes this as basically being white and heavy, sweet and hot, fluffy and animalic, challenging and inviting, gracious and calm, dreamy and awakening. So his version of this, his poetic poem, his dream of Inverno Russo is kind of his imagination, Russian Adam's imagination of the scent of a Russian winter. But while you're inside of your cozy house, your cabin, the fire's on, but outside it's just coming down, it's just pissing down snow, okay? Uh, but there's this perfectly balance in this of love and hate because you're in your cozy air, you got your most comfortable pajamas on or whatever it is, right? Your warm PJs, your, your underwear, your warm underwear, all that stuff, you're by the fire, and um, your long johns, and but outside it's cold as a which is tit, okay? Um, and so this kind of displays this calm, serene beauty, but also almost like this, he says it could, it, it um, feels like it's calm, serene, quiet beauty, but also it may deliver the most severe suffering, right? There's that contrast. This stuff is amazing. Um, so that's musk, but the real musks are you know, there's a lot of real Ensar musk that some people swear by. I've yet to smell, but okay. Now let's do oak moss. So we're gonna do um, R. de Capucci by Roberto Capucci. I've got five of these little 10 mLs, um, and it's a fragrance very few people talk about. It's a spicy green fragrance from the 80s. Um, it's been a while since I've sprayed this bad boy. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is like oak moss city. Um, starts off very green though. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some galvanum artemisia in here. Um, very earthy green with lots of citruses um, and, and aldehydes and beautiful florals, jasmine and rose with uh, mandarin orange, but really the base is just filled with mosses. Scratchy, smoky mosses, smoke moss, because it's frankincense and moss with leather, musk, patchouli, sandalwood, uh, Tonka bean and vetiver, I think. Um, oh, what's her name? Um, the, the woman that Pierre Bourdon married early on and then divorced her. Oh, man, I can't think of her name. The perfumer. Someone will leave it in the comments. But I think she made this, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Francois Caron. Francois Caron. Um, this is amazing stuff, though, Art de Capucci. If you're an oak moss lover, and uh, this is discontinued, but you can find stuff like that. I found these for super cheap. That's the reason I got these little 10 mLs instead of going for a full bottle. Sometimes you got to go with what you can get, you know? Um, but Art de Capucci is worth your, your time hunting if you're an oak moss lover. The other one I'm going to highlight, which does not get much talk, is Character. And the vintage bottles are different than the new stuff. The new stuff has this, like, um, these, like, lines here on the front. And um, 
The Eau de Toilette, I think, is on top instead of on the bottom, but these vintage bottles can be had still for relatively good money. I think Anuj and Enchante has some, but it, it you could also highlight this under the Castorium area. Even though this was the end, eight, 1989, this is kind of a late bloomer, kind of like, um, you know, the other one for Animalix I could have highlighted would have been um, something like Joint by Rocco Barocco. Um, that came out in 92, but it feels like an 80s fragrance. This came out in 89, so it is technically an 80s fragrance, but it feels like an early 80s fragrance, if that makes sense. Man, this R de Capucci is really good. I need to, I need to talk about that. Um, but Character is also really good, and it is, um, Carnation, Artemisia, but it starts off very animatic. Like, at first, it's like the Castorium shoots up through the... Um, note tree and just hits you right at the top and then recedes back down into the base and a base a huge slug of oak moss in the base of, of the vintage bottles of character cedar wood and leather amazing stuff and i'm going to show you one new one that you can just get if you can buy right now without worrying about reformulation or anything this is moose illuminate by rogue and there's literally a picture of a lichen right there on the damn packaging um so moose illuminate is this um Damn it, I just closed the tab. I'm not very good at this. Moose Illumine. There we go. Um, uh, come on. So actually, there's a new Moose Illumine that just came out called Absolute de Moose. Um, it's like an X-ray version, I think, of, of, of this. But I, I love this one. I mean, I don't feel like I need the X-ray version. I'd like to smell it, though, because I really like Manny Cross's work. But this is um, Tree Moss white musks, bay leaf. There's something a little bit camphoraceous about this. Like when you put on aftershave and it burns, there's like that burning sensation, but with tons of fluffy oak moss. Okay. It's beautiful. Uh, actually a really well done green spicy fragrance. Um, man, this Arctic Capucci is fucking phenomenal. Uh, okay. Next on the list we have Oud. So we've got Oud, Patchouli, Rose, Sandalwood, Vanilla, Vetiver left. So six more. So the Oud, I just grabbed a handful of, of some Ouds that you've probably heard me talk about. They're all going to be the real Oud, except for one. Uh, I grabbed a designer just so I didn't have all NSARS and, Rush, and Russian Adams work. But I grabbed EO number one. Um, this uses Assam Oud in the base and uh, Thai Oud in the heart. And you've heard me talk about this before. It's very leathery. The guy that made this, um, Habib Dingle, made the um, Bibles that the Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II, he, he used to make his leather bound for his Bibles. He was like a fam very famous leather maker. This stuff is phenomenal. It has grown, really, really grown on me. Ensar's work has grown on me, but it has that Ensar sparkle. So imagine Castorium, Cypress, Lavender, Rosewood, Civet, uh, Gallic Rose, Tolu Balsam, Himalayan Rose, Turkish Rose, all these different types of roses, different types of ouds, amazing sandalwood, Papua sand Papau sandalwood, ambergris, tobacco, tree moss, Ethiopian frankincense, and it all comes across to smell like this beautiful um, leather, you know, like this hardcore leathery take on a rose oud. Um, go watch my review. I've got a review of EO1 on the channel. I've since changed my tune a little bit, though, on some of these NSARs. I've come to really love them. But NSAR, you could talk about, you could mention Russian Oud, which is a take on chocolatey Oud. Very wearable Oud, but a beautiful Oud. Um, you know, you could talk about Oud Zen, which I've discussed on the channel before. Um, anything, my scent of the day, by the way, is this. And it, it literally lasted all day. I sprayed it this morning. And I can still smell it, okay? It's this. Anything from this History of Oud collection, if you want to reference Oud to study, this History of Oud collection is... I did a live stream on the History of Oud collection if you want to check it out. But, I mean, this is almost like 98% pure Oud oil in this bottle, just with a little bit of perfumer's alcohol so you could spray it. And this Indian Oud is, I mean, cherry-like, but so smooth, like cherry, cherry wood smooth. Um... Go watch my live stream if you want to. And I think I did individual reviews on each one of these as well. I love these so much. Like, this is a reference oud, okay? But good, I don't want to say good luck finding them, but they're going to be tough to find. Um, 
because there were limited batches, but I wish Russian Adam would do more stuff like that because he is an oud distiller, right? At his heart, he is an oud distiller. Um, and and so one more I grabbed just so I could say it, they're not all Aris Ladores, and but Leather Oud by Dior is one I like. Um, civet, leather, beeswax, oud, cardamom, clove, sandalwood, cedar, patchouli, vetiver, um, leather oud. I'll, I'll review one of these days and... Someone told me I had to get the bottle where the C and the D don't come together, but I tell no, I can see no difference to my bottle with the C and the D together. So, and then they were like, well, what year is your bottle? And I was like, well, this is a 2015. They were like, oh, well, the reformulation happened in 2013. I was like, well, I mean, fuck. So you got to hunt like an original bottle. So yeah, that's, I'm not going to do that. I'm happy with leather root actually, um, with the ones that I have. Okay. Next on the list, we have patchouli, one of my favorite ingredients. First of all, one of my all-time favorite patchoulis is Kritzia Moods Womo. Um, I like the fact that this is actually a rough, like, you know, my beard, you know, it's got that scratchy feeling to the patchouli. I don't like when the patchoulis are soft or gentle. I like my patchoulis hardcore, like the original Givenchy Gentleman from 1974. Um, but this just almost takes that patchouli. I mean, you want patchouli, people? This is patchouli. Uh, reference patchouli for me and um it 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 almost like encapsulates this masculine this masculine 80s kind of accord around that patchouli is basically what it's done um moods walmo is good stuff and you can find it for still relatively cheap the other one i'll i'll kind of highlight here is um borneo 1834 which is a fragrance that uh, i think inspired things like cora mandel a couple years later um and I really need to review this. I think it's earthy, spicy, chocolatey patchouli because there's cacao and patchouli. They did the cacao and leather and uh, vetiver thing as well with vetiver oriental. So the cacao and other ingredient notes for Serge Luton has really worked out well. It's a little bit camphoraceous. It's earthy. It's um, dank. It's green. The labdanum plays beautifully in here because... The labdanum gives it that stickiness and the patchouli gives it the earthiness. There's some galvanum, which adds to the greenness here and spicy cardamom, which adds to that kind of, um, you know, that cooling spiced facet. But I'll, I'll review Borneo 1834. This has surprised me by how much I like it. Let's just say it that, put it that way. This has surprised me. And I didn't buy this. This was a gift from... Uh, I did a, a Serge Luton live stream like a year or two ago where basically this guy who claimed he worked in some fashion with the company for 40 years was like, hey man, I'm really digging your videos. I want to send you some stuff so you can kind of talk about it on the channel um, or just get to know it and don't talk about it, whatever. I'm just sending it to you as a friend. I said, okay. And he sent me like 13 Serge Luton, 10 Serge Luton or something. Go watch the video. You'll find it under the um, un, under the live streams. If you go through my live streams, you'll see it. But that was one of the bottles. And um, it's funny because I told him I didn't want any of these. I wanted all the vintage ones. I was like, send me any of the vintage bottles you have. He was like, well, I only got this one. I was like, okay, fine. I'll take it. And you know what? I've come to really like it. There is a little bit of like a plasticky smell. And I'm curious if that plasticky smell is also in the original. But... You know, that's like 1% of the fragrance. The other 99% of the fragrance, I think, is amazing. So, yes, Borneo 1834. And I think Serge Luton does good reformulations. Okay, and then the new patchouli, if you will, the new kid on the block that I really like is Psychedelic by Javoy. I really like this house, Javoy. I think they're amazing value for money. Um, this is an earthy, chocolatey Indonesian patchouli. Oh, yeah. Earthy, spicy Lots of labdanum. Again, even more labdanum than Borneo 1834. Imagine like Cystus labdanum with vanillas and Jacques Fleury of Robertet made this. Robertet, um, they do a lot in the niche realm that most people don't even know about. But yes, they're amazing perfumers at Robertet. Um, so that's psychedelic. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Rose. Now, Rose, we've got four to discuss. So the first one we're going to talk about is from... Um, 1971 and it is aromatics elixir so aromatics elixir um i had a newer bottle but um andrea very kindly sent me a vintage bottle and um i have been in love with this bottle this vintage juice this little vintage juice right here has set my world on fire man i am 
I am in love with this stuff. Kind of in the same way I was in love with Azure the first time I smelled it for a leather Sheepra. And that's the power of Bernard Chant. I'm telling you, he is one of the greatest perfumers to ever live. I really believe that. I think Bernard Chant is an absolute legend. Mount Rushmore, um, top three all-time perfumers. I did a perfumer's portfolio video on him if you guys want to dive into it. But this is one of the greatest spicy, rose-heavy Sheepras I could think of. Man, just, and you know, it's, so the, the next, I'll tell you the next fragrance I was going to mention is, is Aramis 900 for, for Aramis. And you know, these two are connected. There's no doubt about it. Just like Aramis, the original Aramis and Azure are connected. And, and Bernard Chant loved taking a fragrance like this and marketing it towards women and then making something that smelled very, very similar and marketing it towards men. Um, and this has a little bit of tuberose in it. This doesn't. Um, this has a little bit of frankincense in it. This doesn't. But, I mean, overall, the smells are very, very, very similar. I think the civet's actually heavier in this than in Aromatics Elixir. But I always used to say I think I like this more than Aromatics Elixir, but I only smelled the new one. Now that I've smelled the vintage Aromatics Elixir, I may like this even more. I think I might like this even more than Aramis 900, but it's, I'm going to review both of them one of these days, but they are just some of the best perfume you can get though. I'll tell you that amazing, amazing stuff, especially for rose lovers. That's a reference rose. The other reference rose that um, does not get very much talk and you can find this on the cheap. You can find these little 25 mil bottles for like 30 bucks. You can find 100 mil bottles for 100 bucks. You can find 250 or 200 mil bottles for like 250 bucks or something. It's crazy. Um, especially for a discontinued fragrance from the 80s, those prices are very reasonable. This is Actor. Um, and Actor is a spicy floral rose. It uses some notes that separated a little bit, but you can smell the, um, I would say you can smell the inspiration that Aramis 900 and Aromatics Elixir had on Actor. Um, it, it uses some things that set it apart, like, uh, for example, it's got Calamus, it's got um, Caraway, which is not listed in either note listing, but all in all, um, if you're into these kind of rose-heavy compositions marketed towards men, or I would even say Aromatics Elixir, even though it's marketed towards women, is a pretty masculine composition for nowadays. It's more masculine than 99% of the shit that comes out nowadays. This is another one to put on the rose list. Um, and finally, I have to list this one because this is my favorite. And this just goes to show for people who are like, you always talk about stuff that's hard to find. Well, shit, I can't even find a bottle of this. And it's my, it's, it's literally been on my top like if, if you said, Ramsey, you can get one full bottle right now, I wouldn't even think. It would be Malik Al-Taif. Malik Al-Taif is a fragrance that is me through and through. Like, it's it's the artisanal version of how I feel about Bellamy. It is, oh my fucking God, man. It is just phenomenal. Um, and I only have like a couple sprays left, so I'm cherishing every spray of that. Um, Malik Al-Taif is... Um, the king of Taif is basically what that means, but they, this is 40% royal grade Taif rose picked with only women's hands because the owner of the rose, um, the land where these Taif roses are grown in, in Saudi Arabia, discovered that he thought that the roses smelled different when a woman's hands picked it versus a man's hands. Thought the men's hands had more I don't know, oils on them or something, and that the gentler women's hands made the flowers smell different. So he did a specific experiment just for Russian Adam. Um, and and then there's this animalic sort of um, Indian oud that's mixed with it, and real musk. So there's real musk, Indian oud, rose, saffron, sandalwood, cyan benzoin, and amber. And it is just, I mean, if I was like a sultan, if you're like Ramsey, you are now Sultan of this of this country. I would be like, hunt me down every single bottle of Malik Al Taif in the world because I would I would literally just make this my signature scent. This is regal, royal. I mean, that that's what I think about when I think about Malik Al Taif. I mean, it's like this is how I would expect like a prophet to smell, like a 
like Jesus to smell. Like Jesus walks by, this is what I would expect the air to fucking smell like. It smells phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Okay, next on the list we've got um, sandalwood. Now, there's only two that I'm highlighting here. Um, sandalwood is a tough note, I think, because modern sandalwood smells at times pickly and, um, you know, like it's, um, like it's ready to fight you. You know, modern sandalwood is, is scratchy. It's, it's, uh, everything the opposite of what vintage sandalwood was. So this is actually a vintage bottle of the Eau de Toilette version, not the modern, but the Eau de Toilette, which is discontinued. Now they only sell it in the Eau de Parfum. Chanel Bois de Zeal. Bois de Zeal is, uh, and I would love to get a pure parfum version of this too, by the way. But this stuff is like refined, you know, if, if Malik Altaif is glorious luxury, um, this is like refinement. This is like soft luxury. It is, um, Bois de Zeal is uh, a Jacques Poles creation. And, of course, Jacques Paul is one of the greatest perfumers of all time. Probably up there on that Mount Rushmore with Bernard Chant. And uh, this is Bergamot, Mandarin Orange, Ylang Ylang, New Caledonian Sandalwood, Tonka Bean, and Vanilla. And I've often said Sandalwood has these little red flowers that grow off of them. And um, this almost smells like you're smelling the sandalwood and the little flowers that grow on it. Like you're smelling the air. Like they just took a perfect picture of the air around a sandalwood tree. It's beautiful. It is... It is Chanel class through and through. The other one, which I'll show, which is the exact opposite of that, um, because Bois de Zeal is soft and gentle and quiet. Like, if you wanted to wear that to, like, a proper business meeting, you can't go wrong with Bois de Zeal. But my favorite sandalwood of all time, reference sandalwood for me, literally comes in a sandalwood tree, which is one of the most badass fucking, I think, presentations I've ever seen. This is an actual slice of a sandalwood tree. Um, I don't even want to know what this presentation cost. This is Santal Galore. Santal Galore is um, from the Six Collection, and it's basically a fruity shebra because, well, first of all, you have sandalwood in the top heart and base. So the top is sandalwood and durian, which durian, some people go, yeah, durian, I'm telling you, the durian in here is amazing. Um, go watch my review of um, Santal Galore. But it's not what you would expect. It's not like dirty socks or wet underwear that's moldy or whatever some people say durian smells like. Um, the middle notes are sandalwood, smoke, Turkish rose, rose water, jasmine, and osmanthus. And the base is sandalwood, natural musk, oak moss, tonka bean cloves, and cassia. Um, so real deer musk, real sandalwood, um, real, uh, what did they say? Um, old Mysore sandalwood absolute made by Russian Adam. So this is proper Mysore sandalwood. And I mean, it is just like, you talk about reference sandalwood. This is reference sandalwood for me. Okay. Only a couple more left. Next on the list, we've got vanilla. Now vanilla is gear long through and through. Like when I think of vanilla, I think of Guerlain, period, end of story. There's almost no competitors to, to Guerlain vanilla for me. So, of course, we've got Chalamar, which, um, I mean, you know, this is the Eau de Toilette. You can get the Eau de Parfum. I've got the Pure Parfum back there, the extra. ray they're, they're all, every single, you cannot go wrong with Chalamar. It is top 10 fragrance for me, okay? Top 10. Um, Chalamar is... Um, modeled after the Taj Mahal, which was erected by um, the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan for his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, who died in childbirth, giving birth to like their 13th kid or something. Uh, but he was crushed by her death. And um, so imagine the Taj Mahal being a monument to their love. And this is that, you know, this is... Um, two sweaty bodies coming together. That's the way that the dirtiness of the vanilla almost feels like. It's um, balsamic. It's uh, classy. It's a little bit dirty. I wouldn't be surprised. There's a little bit of castorium in here as well. There's a huge slug of bergamot in the top, but it's a uh, reference oriental, spicy oriental for me. Just uh, one of the all-time greats. This bottle's from the 80s, but um, I don't think even the new stuff, I've got a... 
I've got a, let's say within the last 10 years, it's been issued Eau de Parfum from Shalimar, and it is amazing. It is everything Shalimar should be. So if Thierry Vosser has done anything right at Guerlain, it's keeping these classics still in good condition. Okay, next on the list is Abbey Rouge. So reference vanilla number one, Shalimar, reference vanilla number two, Abbey Rouge. Um, I have not reviewed this, but I have reviewed, well, I need to review this. This is, um, for me, I mean, one of the greatest masculines ever released. It came out in 1965. Um, it uh, has rosewood and beautiful um, citruses in the top, lemons, oranges, a green lemon, bitter orange, with that beautiful patchouli and that vanilla benzoin leather and... Um, you know, the, the vintage bottles, which this is a discontinued Eau de Cologne version of Abbey Rouge. They don't make this version any longer. Um, it's a little bit more leathery into the dry down. You know, this speaks to Jean-Paul Guerlain's love of horses and hunting and all of that stuff, right? It's a hunting um, coat, or I don't know what they call it, but it's like a hunting um, jacket or whatever it is um, that you get when you become a master hunter. You get the red jacket or whatever it's modeled after that jacket that's where the rouge comes from the the red hunting jacket um and it is citrusy spicy leathery vanillic i mean you didn't put vanilla in masculine perfumery in 1965 right it just was it was seen as a women's note and um but but this is just i mean for me this is a forever fragrance um abbey rouge okay Last note, it's vetiver, and of course we have to go with the greatest vetiver of all time. Uh, vetiver being kind of a um, grass, very popular in India, specific type of grass that the roots are extracted to create this oil from. And um, so first we have Guerlain's vetiver, also in the discontinued Eau de Cologne, but any version again, even the newer stuff is amazing. They keep this in great condition. Um, it's uh, bergamot, lemon, orange, nutmeg, pepper, vetiver, tobacco, and tonka bean. And that tobacco gives it a little bit of this old school masculinity to it. You know, this, um, I just think of like, you know, coarse hands and um, a man who works with his hands kind of thing. There's this outdoorsy feel to vetiver. It's um, very grassy in the opening, but it dries down much tougher than it starts. It starts off soft with the grassy outdoorsiness and it kind of, um, turns into a spicier, heavier into the dry down, a little bit more masculine into the uh, dry down. But that is just reference vetiver. The other one is Roja's vetiver. I mean, I love this stuff. It is um, Guerlain's vetiver, Roja it up. I did a full review on Roja's vetiver. You can check it out. Um, he's used, let's say, a Kubiba here, which basically brings those citrus notes heavier into the dry down. It, it tricks you into thinking you're smelling citruses deeper into the dry down. He's, it, it feels like a cheaper construction that he's amped up the vetiver on a little bit and used some things to make you think you're smelling more vetiver, like celery, you know, earthy notes like that as well. Celery, seeds, and stuff like that. Um, and finally, for an earthy vetiver, final one on this list is Etro's uh, Vetiver. This is, an, or this is a discontinued Eau de Cologne, um, but Etro is a house that's very underrated and this stuff is absolutely amazing. It's so deep and rich and earthy. You could also say Ancre Noir here, but I went with Etro because I think it's a house that deserves some love. Okay, so that's my list. I hope you enjoy it. Um, that's my reference video for celebrating 9,000 subscribers. Thank you to everyone who subscribed. Let me know what your favorites are. There will be a part two of this at some point. Maybe I'll wait till 10,000 subs, but, but we'll see. Um, as always, it's a pleasure. Thank you to everyone who got us to the 9,000 milestone. Thanks for watching and participating and commenting and, and all the stuff you guys do to make the channel special and amazing. So thanks for being part of the Ram Fam. Cheers, guys. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.